All right, and now for our esteemed faculty reader, Sandra Singlow. Sandra Singlow's best-selling books include Mother on Fire, behind me, A Year in Van Nuys, Depth Takes a Holiday, and a novel, If You Lived Here, You'd Be Home by Now, which was named by the Los Angeles Times as one of the best 100 fiction books of 1998. Two of her hit solo shows, sorry, <laughs> Aliens in America and Bad Sex with Bud Kemp, ran off Broadway. Sugar Plum Fairy ran at the Geffen Playhouse, I Worry at the Kennedy Center and Actors Theater of Louisville. Her short story, My Father's Chinese Wives, won a Pushcart Prize in 1996 and is also featured in the Norton Anthology of Modern Literature. Lowe has been a regular commentator on NPR's Morning Edition and on Ira Glass's This American Life. Currently, her weekly segment, The Low Life, is heard on KPCC and her daily minute, The Lowdown on Science, is syndicated on 200 stations. A three-time National Magazine Award nominee, she is a contributing editor for the Atlantic Monthly. Ladies and gentlemen, Sandra Singlow. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I, I just, I'm such a proud mother. Everyone who has read here tonight, with the exception of Karen, but I want to see you later, has been a student of mine or is a student of mine now. So it's, I, it, you guys all rocked very hard, and I see some other students. So. Awesome work. Wow. And I've been doing that and like fantastic. Now on to the subject of sloth. I love the theme of the evening and I decided to pull back. The great thing about being a middle aged midlist author is at some point your books will go out of print. Hence they will be new to a new audience. And I'm like going, some of these essays were in nineteen ninety two, so there could be people in MBW who had not been born when I wrote these. But I look great, don't I? Just very fresh, very good. All right. So I decided to go back. You know, NBC had this kind of like, uh, kind of slogan, if it's new to you, it's new. So I thought I would pull back to my first book, Death Takes a Holiday. See how 80s, even though this was in the 90s, I think this was published in 1996. Original hardback. Uh, yeah, same. You're just cracking up back there. Um, so I thought I'd re read two pieces here about the theme of sloth, and I, I love what Marielle was saying about the rock bottom jobs, honey. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Hear me roar. So the first piece is called "The Joy of Champing," and the second one is well, just let you let it happen as it happens. Okay. All right. Um, and you don't get great. And I had my video game piece with Adrian, but I don't think I could, you know, compete with how great that was, but in Nintendo was fine. Anyway, long story, let's move on. Okay, the joy of tamping. Nowadays, when I hit the light at Burbank in Laurel Canyon, I get to turn my car south. Yes, south towards studio. You know, I really can't. Let me try again. Because I look at you and it becomes a blur. Let's try again. Okay. Nowadays, no, I'm going to go back to the glasses. That's what I'm <laughs> Right. Everybody did a professional reading but me. Okay. Again. <clears throat> Nowadays, new to you, this time again. When I hit the light at Burbank and Laurel Canyon, I get to turn my car south. Yes, yeah, south. Towards Studio City, West Hollywood, and Beverly Hills. Because I have meetings now, I do. My career has progressed to the point, this is, I'm right, this is 25 years ago. My career has progressed to the point where I actually get to meet with industry people and brainstorm plot twists for movies of the week. After two years of these meetings, all I've gotten out of them is a couple of bottles of water and parking validation most of the time. <laughs> but that's another story. The point is, I'm grateful to be in a loop, any loop, even a rotten loop. Because a couple of years ago, I used to go north on Laurel Canyon, north, deep into Van Nuys. <laughs> See, it's always good for a laugh, isn't it? I made my career on Van Nuys, and it still works, doesn't it? Van Nuys. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, there you go. should go back to that. Deep into Van Nuys, North Hollywood. Silmar. <laughs> Your shout out for Silmar? All right. Okay. Land of fluorescent lighting, faux hardwood paneling, olive green carpet, and gummy IBM Selectrics. That was before most of your times. Gummy IBM Selectrics. That's a typewriter. I know you don't know what that is, but anyway. I went north because I was a temp. That is, I was a W-2 form carrying member of Stiver's temporary personnel, executive and legal secretaries, clerks, word processors, receptionists, data, 
the pages stuck together. Data. It's exciting, though, to wait, isn't it? Data, data entry. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. You haven't seen America until you've tapped your way across the floor of the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> to my journey. My story begins in early 1990, a bad year. Is there anyone here who was born after 1990? Okay. 19, I mean, a year in which I was trying to do nothing but write. These are the MPW years. For those of you, I was an MPW student. I know your pain. After three months, my daily routine had dwindled to waiting for four rejection letters to flutter in through the mail slot. They used to have letters and nails. Anyway, um, uncontrollable weeping would follow, then the ritual Medea-like howling of my mantra. I'm a failure! I'm a failure! The rest of my time was spent gaining 13 pounds, refusing to change out of my sweats outfit, and accusing my living boyfriend of not finding me attractive anymore. <laughs> God has a way of making you run out of money at certain moments in your life. His way, I guess, of making you say, uncle. And so it was that my fingers ended up walking through the yellow pages and landing on Stiver's temporary personnel. It was a cold day in February when I drove to Ventura Boulevard for my personal skills evaluation. <laughs> yeah. Waiting at a stoplight, I had to admit it felt pretty good to be out of the house. Showered and dressed, doing something. It was heartening to imagine buying groceries again. Wheat thins, shampoo, maybe even some Gallo wine, French Colombard, 429 a jug. Even better, it became immediately clear to me that the good folks at Stivers were going to release me from the terrible burden of being myself. No one asked difficult questions like, this really puts me in mind of Mariel's piece, it really does. No one asked difficult questions like, at age 28, with a BS in physics and two master's degrees, one from MPW at USC, shouldn't you be making more than $7.75 an hour? No. On the contrary, they ask three simple words. Can you type? <laughs> Amazingly. I could. <laughs> 60 words, count 60 a minute. There were pleased smiles all around. I felt a surge of confidence. So what if these weren't words that the New Yorker would even care to glance through and reject? The talent liaison at Stiver's talent liaison assured me my efforts were worth something, particularly since there were minimal spelling errors that I tabbed over mostly correctly. In fact, I was feeling a kind of champ euphoria reported by many other unemployed bohemians. <laughs> Maybe we couldn't finish that PhD thesis, novel, screenplay about the Korean War, found object earring collection, relationship, grant proposal, tuba symphony, your own gnawing onus insert here. But think how many things we can do and do very, very well. Alphabetize, change paper trays, weigh mail, weigh mail and make coffee. And of course, Nothing spells satisfaction like filched office supplies. <laughs> My first temp job was, believe it or not, for a magician. <laughs> a magician? He was a mild-mannered fellow who had a small, shabby office in North Hollywood, right off Lancashire. Or should I say, off, off Lancashire. <laughs> Thank you for that. It was one of, that's a very North Hollywood joke. Yeah, you know, you know, Rosita, it's, it's North Hollywood. You know, off, off Lancashire. Or is it off, off, off? Uh, can we go? All right. It was in one of those quasi-industrial alleys where they sell things like steel cable, bolts, needle nose pliers. In my mind, magicians were Siegfried and Roy or nothing. This was before the accident. Nick Siegfried or Roy or nothing. Who knew there was anything in between? But indeed, this man, whom I had never heard of, was working, even touring, Reno, cruise ships, dinner theater in Salinas. This man's phone was ringing. My job was type, to type show lists like mini haiku. Here's one, four lines only. Linking rings, three scarves, girl in box. In parentheses, use audience member. Last line, end with monkey. <laughs> Thank you for that. I always thought, you know, it doesn't look good on a page that you got it. You know, it just, it just sits there and you go, that, that's, that's going to suck. But, right. You want glamour? From North Hollywood, I traveled north to an amp amplifier factory in Silmar. No, don't laugh, don't laugh. This was the Prince of Gigs. Shut up already, this is good, okay, all right? This was the Prince of Gigs. Not only was I pulling in a whopping $11 an hour, but my boss had only one rule. Absolutely no beer at your desk before 4 p.m. <laughs> 
but we close to that mostly, except on Wednesdays, um, Thursdays, and Fridays. And as if that weren't enough, this was the job that made me part of publishing history, people. Have you ever been in an amplifier store and seen the Tube Amp Book 2 by R. Aspen Pittman? I like that. Karen doesn't doesn't believe that, but I, I did. Just check it out. It's type by me. Okay, of course it wasn't long before my feelings of temp euphoria came crashing down to earth. It happened at Kramer Wilson Insurance Company in North Hollywood. Kramer Wilson. All right. Let us begin by considering the phrase statistical typing pool. Can you think of anything less statistical than 20 hostile women being paid $8.75 an hour to type numbers onto triplicate insurance forms from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m.? Especially since nowadays any, and this was early, but still, especially since nowadays any $400 Radio Shack computer can do this more job more quickly and efficiently without having to go to the bathroom to adjust its slip every 15 minutes. But somehow the 90s had not reached Kramer. Well, <coughs> nor, for that matter, at the 60s. Because to add insult to injury, Kramer Wilson felt that ours was a task that could not be performed without wearing control top pantyhose. At least that's what our manager, a 60-ish bird-like woman named Frances, named Kane. Every morning she'd walk, let's see if I can do this without feedback, I don't think it would. Every morning she'd walk up and down the aisles of the typist, silently patrolling. After lunch, Carl's Jr. filet of fish sandwich, dollar seventy nine. Violators of the pantyhose law would receive their reprimand. My third reprimand occurred on a day when I was wearing pants, boots, and knee socks, plus a turtleneck sweater, bra, clean underwear, and a daisy fresh panty shield. If you must know. Thank you for that, Karen. Me and Karen, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna make it together. Not an inch of arm or leg was showing. I reached of dial, and yet Francis assured me in hushed tones, without pantyhose, I was in violation. <laughs> Something about health codes. <laughs> My friend Mel suggested I should have pulled Francis aside and whispered, Francis, I am wearing pantyhose but I had to cut out the crotch ventilator panel, and here it is. <laughs> of course, I didn't think to do that at the time. Returned to the typing pool and realized that the mailboy had come early, wheeling off a whole sheaf of car insurance premium statements upon which I had typed mis mistakenly $3,000 instead of $300. I had intended to open them all and fix my mistake, but why? The error wouldn't be discovered for another week. By then, I'd be temp history. Like the many unnamed who had gone before me, I'd uncovered the power of being a temp. <laughs> At 3.15, all the typists retired, as we did every day, to the snack room for our 15-minute break. There, under the hum of the fluorescent lights, vending machines gently cradled shiny packets of Doritos, cheese doodles, and chip -ahoys. Red digital letters flashed. Enjoy a tasty snack treat now. Enjoy a tasty snack treat now. Enjoy a tasty snack treat now. An update? Damn it. I do. <laughs> oh, those camping days. Yet I miss those. Camping is still more pleasurable than writing on a bad day, isn't it, really? Sometimes you're anything. All right. And the second and last piece I'm going to is the other side of sloth. Um, and uh, this is a piece that really doesn't fit into any category, but let's say you're slothful and you're desperately trying to have fun in a world where you, you, you can't quite. And um, somehow this put me in mind of, of the theme. And this is, this is a piece called, um, let's see, Nudes on Ice. <laughs> Anyone ever heard of Nudes on Ice? Well, you're about to, Josh. <laughs> Okay, and, and this is, and Mike is my, my um, was my boyfriend at the time. When Mike, and he was a musician, when Mike first told me he was going to Las Vegas for two weeks to do the Marilyn McCoo show at the Desert Inn, I was excited. Two weeks in Las Vegas. 
Marilyn McCoon with her big hair and rhinestone gowns, fifth dimension, please, before your time. You know what I mean. All right. You, you got it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. She's your way home. Marilyn McCoon with her big hair and rhinestone gown singing, up, up and away, stretch limousines, free cocktails, shrimp in a glass, showgirls popping amos. Yeah. Mike and I would be put up in some hideous but impossibly luxurious high-rise hotel with a swim-up bar. I would sit on the balcony in dark glasses every day, the ruthless desert sun beating down as I typed on and on about the human decay surrounding us. Some incredible novel would emerge, or at least a searing Rolling Stone article of some kind. Those were the days. It would be totally Hunter S. Thompson-esque. Mike and I would drink tequila in the bathtub, screaming with laughter, saying brilliant things about America and how it was all collapsing. We would smoke pot and have sex all the time. <laughs> Page turn. The first problem was the hotel. Room 347 of the Mardi Gras Inn boasted only Sanyo toaster oven, faulty air conditioning, staticky HBO. Worn beige carpet and a chipped toilet seat completed the picture. Children howled from the murky pool area. <laughs> the second was that Hunter, unlike Hunter S. Thompson et al., Mike had a work schedule. Turned out to be from about four in the afternoon until two in the morning, six nights a week. I stayed in bed drinking Seagram's grape wine coolers in his absence. <laughs> Watching TV, not typing a word. Upon his return, finally, we would share a bag of Doritos and watch some late-night HBO jacuzzi movie, The Hot Tub Club, or Death Spa, too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Two of you have seen it. Sadly, waiting for the odd, exposed breast to bubble towards the screen. Then we drop off into fitful sleep while the air conditioner, only the air conditioner, shuddered and moaned. <laughs> it wasn't the Vegas I envisioned. But on the fifth day, oil. So I thought. Flipping through the Vegas Visitor magazine and my Seagram's induced torpor, buckets of chicken wings around me as I sat up in bed, I suddenly saw it. The show to end all shows. Its title was three small words, harmless when taken individually, and yet volatile in their great and terrible new juxtaposition. News on ice. <laughs> Well, I mean, Tim, total poker face, but I think you're feeling it. Like, I lay back, hyperventilating. <laughs> I whispered excitedly, Brando-esque, nudes on ice. The words bore into my brain. What person could have come up with such a concept? It was the pinnacle of vulgarity. No, no, it was beyond vulgarity, and that it was the perfect expression of it. And what that concept was expressed, the object itself disappeared, and there was only its perfect vulgar image. Nude blonde women in big Las Vegas Lido hats on ice skates as dinner theater. <laughs> Were I to venture to that place, to that news on ice place, I would stand at the mystical edge of the universe, dark clouds bleeding across the troubled sky, ocean churning below. I would stand at the very nadir of the human psyche. Uh, yes, I was on the phone. I'm sure you don't have any tickets tonight. tonight's uh, early show at the Union Plaza Golden Nugget Hotel. I figured such a high concept show, the news, the ice, must be sold out for weeks. The people clawing, screaming to get in. I heard the clicking of a computer keyboard. Oh, you mean nudes on ice? The girl asked blandly. Nudes on ice, yes, I replied, wanting the girl to know I was not afraid of saying it. Oh yeah, still plenty of tickets. How many? The girl continued without comment. One. Visa or MasterCard number. In growing amazement, I realized that apparently this was nothing more than some quotidian ritual to this girl. One could buy one or 100 tickets to nudes on ice, and she was not going to involve you in any kind of like post-futurist dialogue along the way. Now, maybe if I were a man, this would make sense. Putting the ice skating shows of naked women on credit cards was something one expected men to do. They were forever shocking one with revelations about the new topless dancers they'd once dated, etc., etc., blah, blah, blah. But here, I was a lone woman 
feeding myself on a weeknight to nudes on ice. Didn't that seem a little strong? What possible dark occasion could I be solo celebrating? The question still haunted me as I entered the lobby of the Union Plaza Golden Nugget Hotel. A sea of noise and bright lights and slot machines jingling. I'm not sure what single women wore to nude shows, not to mention nude ice skating shows. I had opted for a strict business dress, shoulder pads, a mainline skirt. I jotted notes on a clipboard as I moved forward. If anyone asked me what I was doing there, I would say I'm in quality control. Something on that But even as I took my seat of shame within the designated nudes on ice theater, I could tell that formalities were being dispensed with, and rapidly. For one thing, the theater was shockingly small and dingy. Flanked by worn red velvet curtains, it exuded, it exuded not unbridled debauchery, but rather that sort of brave jollity you see in some of the less popular children's attractions in Disneyland. The stage, hidden behind a wrinkled curtain, looked much too tiny to house an ice rink of the stunning proportions I had imagined. And the audience, rather than swank coke heads wearing chinchilla coats, diamond anchorage bracelets, and nothing else, they were mostly nice-looking 50-ish couples from the Midwest. The women in slacks, the men in feed store caps. Even more humiliating, it wasn't a full house. Lights dimmed. From a little booth up above, a miserable little pit band of six musicians with thinning hair and cheap tuxedos, the hunched violinist, the small bald man with big discolored kettle drums. They broke timidly into the New York, New York theme. As the drums rolled, an announcer gaily introduced Nudes on Ice by saying who was in it. And to my horror, it appeared as though its participants voted actual skating credentials. It was so unutterably dark, apparently one of tonight's nudes had actually won the Olympic bronze medal in Helsinki. <laughs> the curtain lifted. We strained forward. There was a swirl of rhinestones and pink feathers. A dozen smiling women with big eyebrows and plumed headdresses skated about on the tiny stage before a gaily painted backdrop that looked like some hideous flat out of Hee Haw. Well, that's the older reference. Oh, he but where were the nudes? And then you realized, at both sides of the stage, two skaters were standing, frozen, like ornamental urns. Their big plumed headdresses pushed down on their foreheads. Their bedraggled pink feathers seemed sorely in need of dry cleaning. While they were not strictly nude, the piece of material that usually covered the bust seemed to be missing. They were the nudes and they were none too pleased about it. <laughs> and all about them, as if in a bejeweled kaleidoscope, the others who had material across their tops of their costumes skated about narrowly, doing lazy turns, shaking their feathers out, free of the burdens of the nude, while from the right and the left, the two nudes scowled on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was a wonderful reading.